Hello, and welcome to Burnett Avenue Baptist Church, where Rev. Daniel Corey Scholl is our pastor, and we affirm that Jesus makes life better. Gently rest upon my heart. 
Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 32. It reads like this. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, in all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he came to Peter and said, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of God. You may be seated. I want to label the message on this Lord's Day. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Managing purpose at the breaking point. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Managing purpose at the breaking point. Today is January the 24th, and if the truth be told, as it relates to most to many of us, one word that could characterize us is drained. Uh, New Year's resolutions have gone out the window. <laughs> the joy of the holiday season has dissipated. And once again, all of the challenges and responsibilities of life have come knocking at our door, leaving us overwhelmed. The reality is the best of us can experience periods where we find ourselves overwhelmed. Nobody is exonerated from the possibility of being drained. One reason that you're drained is because if you ever find yourself pouring out to other people, whether it be as a caretaker for aging parents or whether it be as a parent to growing children or wherever it is in life where you find yourself pouring out, if you don't have time to be replenished, you'll find yourself drained. In fact, some, that's why some of us are so mean. That's why some of us can't smile. That's why some of us have lost joy in life. It's not that we are bitter ontologically. It is not that we hop up out of bed in the morning wanting to have a monstrous personality. It is not that we don't want to engage with other people, that we don't want to uh, spread love and joy, but the reality is we keep digging into a reservoir where there is nothing left to give. Life can leave you in those places. In fact, one of the uh, top reasons that persons throughout the United States find themselves medicated for anxiety is because anxiety begins with being overwhelmed, overextended, overtaxed, overcommitted, over dependent on. And all of us, if we're not careful, can find ourselves in a place in life where we find ourselves just overwhelmed. 
Some of us would like to believe that we can't get to that place, but if you don't believe that you can get to that place, I invite you to read our text this morning. Because the Bible lets us know that Jesus found himself at a place where he was overwhelmed. Now, I know you're fine. I know that you're intelligent. I know that you have connections. I know that you are exposed, you're primed, you're proper. But no matter how good you may be, if Jesus could be overwhelmed, you can find yourself at that place as well. Jesus was one who was full of purpose and passion and power for life. He was one who, without mitigation, was destined to achieve something great for God. That he was on a collision course with destiny. That he was on his way somewhere in the name of God and goodness that it was about him that the heavens had been ripped open and God himself started speaking, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It is this Jesus that we find at Gethsemane, the place of the press, on his knees, sweating, beads of blood. I'll run it past you again. The same Jesus who John 1 and 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God had an appointment in Gethsemane because he found himself overwhelmed. Gethsemane was the place of the press. Gethsemane was an olive orchard. It was there that olives were crushed and pressed in order to create a fine oil that was sold throughout the ancient Near East. But without the pressing, there would have been no oil. It is the same in our lives that without God allowing us to go through seasons and moments where we are pressed, and crushed, God can get out the oil that God knows is within our lives, which is why when you find yourself to be overwhelmed as you're attempting to achieve purpose for God, when you find yourself overwhelmed while you're trying to do what God has placed your hands to do, just because you're having a bad day does not mean that God has forgotten about you. Just because you find yourself overwhelmed does not mean that you're not in the will of God. Just because it, it seems that you are really at the breaking point, that does not mean that God does not have his hands on you. Those who God will greatly use, God allows to be pressed. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but maybe you found yourself at your own Gethsemane and you can identify with Jesus in the place of your own Gethsemane. You feel overwhelmed and it's not that you're doing things that you have no business doing. It's not that you're outside of the will of God. You're overwhelmed trying to be purpose driven. And Jesus gives us some critical lessons here in Mark chapter 14 about how we ought to navigate life, how we ought to manage purpose at our breaking point. And everybody has a breaking point. Jesus teaches us that when you, we ought to manage purpose, when you're at overwhelmed, demands that you know when to break away. He teaches us that managing purpose when you're at your breaking point demands that you know when to break away. Notice that Jesus left the Passover meal. He had broken bread for his disciples. He had given them wine to drink. And then he got up from the table and went to Gethsemane. He broke away from his company, from communion with his disciples and went to a place where he could find some respite and a place where he could commune with God. There comes a time if you're going to manage purpose when you're feeling overwhelmed that you've got to learn how to break away. You can't be at every party. You can't be at every social gathering. You can't find yourself always the center of attention. Sometimes you got to break away. Touch somebody and tell them break away. Break away. 
You've got to come to the place where you learn how to turn off the cell phone, turn down the radio, unplug the iPod, log off from the computer so you can commune with God. Sometimes you got to break away if you're going to manage purpose. Jesus had to break away from this, his fellowship with his disciples in order to go to Gethsemane. There comes a time where you've got to begin to analyze your life and ask yourself, am I over-connected? Am I, am, I connect, am I always plugged up? Am I always around other people? Are people always blowing up my cell phone? Are people always coming by my house needing a place to stay? Are people always coming by my home asking for a plate of food? Is somebody always coming asking me, can I drink? drive them somewhere it might be that there comes a moment where you've got to learn how to break away if you don't manage purpose because if you don't break away you'll break down I'm trying to help somebody in here y'all slow coming in the room but y'all can come on you've got to learn how to break away because if you don't learn to break away at critical moments you will break down many of people have been broken by life not because they didn't have what it took in order to go where God was guiding them, but they broke down because they didn't know when to break away. They didn't know where to draw the boundary line. They didn't know how to shut people out. One thing I like about Jesus is over and over in his sojourn on earth, he broke away, found quiet spaces, so that he could get his life. If you're going to manage purpose at the breaking point, you better learn when to break away. But not only if you're going to manage purpose when you're overwhelmed, it demands that you know who to allow into your inner circle. Notice that when Jesus left the Passover meal with his disciples and he broke away to Gethsemane, that Jesus did not take every one of the disciples with him. That he only took three disciples to Gethsemane and he left the other nine at the table. Because Jesus understood that the other nine disciples could not handle Gethsemane. And if you take the wrong crowd to Gethsemane, the wrong crowd at Gethsemane, I wish y'all would come in the room, will cause your Gethsemane to be more stressful than it already is. And the reason that some of us are not able to manage purpose is because we have allowed the wrong people into our inner circle. Everybody is not meant for the inner circle. Mama said, you got some friends, but then you got some acquaintances, but then you got some round the way folk, and you need to understand the difference. Everybody can go to Gethsemane. Everybody is not spiritual enough to go to Gethsemane. Everybody does not have a strong enough connection with God to go to Gethsemane. Everyone does not have a broad enough understanding of the world to go to Gethsemane. Everybody cannot go with you to your Gethsemane. And all of us have a Gethsemane. And maybe today you need to check your roster of friends and begin to ask who among these is qualified not just to be with me on the mountain, but who among these friends can I take to Gethsemane? Because all of us need some ride or dies who will go with Gethsemane to us. And sometimes the same folk who you party with, they don't have the criterion to go with you to Gethsemane because in Gethsemane, you need some prayer warriors. In Gethsemane, you need some people who got some word in them. In Gethsemane, you need some people who will speak those things that are not as though they are. In Gethsemane, you need some people who believes that when you call on God, you'll get an answer. In Gethsemane, you need some people who don't mind lifting up holy hands and saying, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the... At Gethsemane, you better take the right people. 
Everybody can go to Gethsemane. And when attempting to manage purpose, you've got to really give strict attention to who you allow around you. Because just because a person is around you does not mean they are anointed for the journey. Did y'all hear what I said? Uh, and th this sermon ain't for everybody, but it's for somebody. And, and many of us, we are tethered to people who we like, but they're not anointed for the journey. We like them. They fun to be around. They make us smile. They're warm and winsome and have a wonderful personality. But the question is, are they anointed for the journey? Which is the question that you always got to ask whenever you come into any type of covenant relationship with anybody. Is this person anointed for the journey? Because if they're not, I'll get to Gethsemane and they won't be able to take it. Just wink at me. Y'all here with me today? Y'all know what it is to have people. They can handle you as long as you eat at the Cheesecake Factory and everybody's loving you. But as soon as you broke, they, 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 they can't handle having to cook one pot of spaghetti and eat it all week long. They, 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 they know how to, they, they can hang on the mountaintop. But are they anointed for the journey? I mean, you can stay with me at the Marriott, but can you stay with me at Super 8? You like me when we go to Beyonce's concert, but when we got to get it on Redbox DVD and look at it in the living room on TV, can you still dance? Just because they're around don't mean they're anointed for the journey. Only Peter, James, and John were anointed for the journey. And he went to Gethsemane, left Peter, James, and John at the gate, and he went further, and he teaches us a third lesson, and that is managing purpose at the breaking point demands that you tap into the power of prayer. Now, if Jesus had to pray, how is your prayer life? The way Jesus handled the stress of being overwhelmed on one hand and trying to manage purpose on the other hand was to pour out his heart unto God. Which is why prayer, it reminds us again, ought to be our first response and never our last resort. Now, many of us, we respond to stress by cussing folk out and being mean and being bitter and letting everybody know that we're having a bad day. But that is not how Jesus handled being overwhelmed. If your favorite example of Jesus is of him turning over tables, you're a sociopath. And you tell your therapist, I said it. <laughs> Jesus turned over tables one time. But how many other times did we find Jesus handling the stress of his problems through prayer? Jesus went to Gethsemane, got down on his knees, and began to pray his way through the breaking point. I've got to be honest today, I don't know how prayer works. I don't know why prayer works. But I do know that prayer does work. And prayer, if it was important to Jesus Christ, then it ought to be important to you. If it was important enough for Jesus on the way 
to his destiny, trying to manage purpose for him to get down on his knees and begin to pour out himself in prayer. You ought to pray. And notice how Jesus prays. He went and prayed one time, got up, went back and found his ride or die asleep. And, you know, sometimes ride or dies can only go so far with you. What I like about Peter, James, and John, though, is they at least had the ministry of presence. And that is when people are going through, sometimes you can't say anything to them because it ain't nothing that you say, you know. I, you know, I, one thing that grates me is when people get up at funerals and tell uh, deceased, tell relatives of deceased people that God needed a flower to put in his heavenly flower garden. I always think if God can grow all these flowers down here, then surely he can grow. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I see. I just figured he's able to grow all these roses and stuff down here. Why can't he grow something up there? But anyhow. It points to the reality that sometimes when we are in positions where we've got to talk to people who are going through, that we don't always know what to say. Sometimes we just ought to shut up. (laughs) Peter, James, and John just stood on the gate of Gethsemane. They didn't go into Jesus' prayer time, and Jesus, they ended up falling asleep, uh, but they were there at least. And when he went out, he found them sleeping. He told them to wake up. And Jesus went back and prayed again, reminding us that sometimes it's not enough to pray once. Sometimes you've got to labor in prayer. Sometimes you've got to keep praying until God answers you. Sometimes you've got to keep praying for power until God gives you that which you need to transcend the breaking point and resume your journey. Sometimes praying once is not enough. You've got to keep on praying because there is power in prayer. But then after that, Jesus teaches us to manage our purpose at the breaking point by continuing to move toward destiny. After that second time, Jesus got up and began to move toward his confrontation with Judas and, the, and those who he had hired in order to arrest Jesus. And from there, Jesus began to move with determination toward his date with destiny on Golgotha. The consequence of that was Jesus fulfilled his purpose. And because Jesus fulfilled his purpose, you and I are here right now. And me, you and I, we can say that we are saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ, all right? Now, I thought I was in church, and somebody would say amen right there. We, we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has saved us and purified us from our sins. He's cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He's given us right standing with God. Um, being saved means that uh, you're, uh, you and I are called the sons and daughters of God, that we have royalty with God. We have been adopted into the family of God. That is, we have been engrafted, the Bible says, into God's family tree, that you and I are uh, the sons and daughters of God because we have been saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is then why you and I can live the abundant life. We can live with power and vitality and verb and expectation because we've been saved. And because we've been saved so completely, we understand that because of Jesus, life doesn't end on this side. But on the other side, we have eternal life. Um, That is life without end, all because we've been saved. Church folk don't know when to shout, all right? That, yeah, (laughs) I'm glad I've been saved. I hope some of y'all get to the place where y'all can shout about, I've been saved, and I've been, I've been born again. Y'all remember the old folks used to talk like that? You, they used to get a shout and say, I know I've been born again. Because if you ain't got nothing else, if you, I mean, if, if everybody done walked out and left you, if folk talk about you, misunderstand you, drag your name through the mud, at least you got one thing, and that is, I've been saved. 
washed, covered in the blood, filled with God's power. And so it really don't matter if you don't like me. If you don't understand me, if you don't agree, good, fine. All, I've been saved. And because I've been saved, my past can no longer be held against me. And my future yet stands before me because I have been saved by the power that while I was yet a sinner... God loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son to die in my place. And now he has ascended unto high and offers intercession on my behalf. Thank God that I've been saved. Mm. And if you ain't been saved, we'll have an invitation for you after these brief comments. But we celebrate being saved today all because of what Jesus did on Calvary. Jesus never would have gotten to Calvary had he not made it through Gethsemane, which was the place where he was overwhelmed. It is because he trusted God to give him power to make it past his breaking point that he was able to fulfill his purpose. And the word of God for you and I today is don't allow the breaking point of being overwhelmed to stop you from pursuing destiny. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Pray through the breaking point and trust God with power. Trust God to give you what you need in order to transcend that which seems like it's going to break you until you get to the place of destiny. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but whatever purpose God has placed in your mind or in your heart, don't you allow being overwhelmed by life to cripple you, to break you. You keep, keep pressing on the upward way because God has purpose and destiny over your life and you can't afford to stop where you are. That's why the old saying Saints would say, when my heart is overwhelmed with grief, take me to the rock that's higher than I. <laughs> and in times like these, we need a rock. In times like these, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need a savior. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Some of y'all still looking at me kind of strange, but this rock is Jesus. He is the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That's why my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground. I wish I had some help in here. Is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest freight, but holy. Burnett Avenue is located at 6800 South Hurstbourne Parkway in Louisville, Kentucky. Join us for Sunday worship at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 noon. Saturday service is at 6 p.m. and midweek Bible study Wednesdays at 7 p.m. For more information, give us a call at 491-8301.